Transportation was driven by extensive use of coal to generate power through steam, while the discovery of oil in large quantities added yet one more fossil fuel to our energy matrix. What impact did the increasing usage of fossil fuels have on the environment? In one word, it was simply devastating. Unnatural climatic conditions, increased frequency of natural calamities, cities choked by pollution. Fossil fuels have been our primary source of energy for over 200 years. The Industrial Revolution was driven by extensive use of coal to generate power through steam, while the discovery of oil in large quantities added yet one more fossil fuel to our energy matrix. What impact did the increasing usage of fossil fuels have on the environment? In one word, it was simply devastating. Unnatural climatic conditions, increased frequency of natural calamities, cities choked by pollution, are some of the byproducts of fossil fuel usage. The biggest threat to our survival comes from global warming caused by carbon emissions from burning fossil fuels and the resultant climate change. In a symbolic portrayal of what our future may hold, Iceland held a funeral to mark the death of the first glacier which melted due to climate change. The big question now is, can we replace fossil fuels and move towards a carbon-free world? Can the sun and the wind power our energy needs and can we stop this inevitable march of climate change? I feel that is eminently possible and my book charts a clear roadmap to such a fossil-free world. Clearly, clean energy will have to be the key. Man-made greenhouse emissions were highest due to energy generation by fossil fuels. So quick adoption of solar and wind energy can help bring down these emissions. To give you an example, residential solar or rooftop solar installations alone offer a potential capacity of 15 gigawatts. Similarly, rooftop installations by commercial and industrial customers can offer a capacity of almost 60 gigawatts. That's not all. Hard to abate sectors like cement and steel need to use solar energy and wind energy in their manufacturing processes. And the auto sector needs an aggressive electric vehicle rollout plan. The real game changer, however, will be utility scale solar and wind projects, which are bringing down carbon emissions across the world. But will this transition be affordable? And can a developing country like India bear the cost? The answer is an emphatic yes. In my book, I analyze real-time data and show how cheap renewable energy has become. To give you a small example, tariff-based competitive bids to supply power are being won by clean energy companies at prices lower than 3 rupees per unit of electricity. In dollar terms, only around 4 cents a unit. Renewables have yet another big benefit. They make us less dependent on imported fossil fuels. Growth in this sector will have a direct impact on the economy, boosting jobs, creating new entrepreneurs, and expanding our country's manufacturing capacity. Our company recently announced plans to manufacture solar modules and cells in India by investing about 2,000 crore rupees. And I'm sure that many of our other companies in the sector are planning to do the same. My book attempts to capture this huge transition happening across the globe and in India and create a playbook for a carbon light India. You can order Fossil Free on Amazon. Hello everybody. Locust attack, melting polar ice, rising sea level, forest fire. We have only one planet where we all live. And this is where all the life forms that we know of also exist. This planet is in dire need for care and attention. The next panel discussion discusses the same from a perspective of a, a fossil free world and the use of renewable energy. So uh, let me announce the grand panel. Uh, discussing the topic will be fossil fuel free world, when and how. We are racing towards the world, climate change reality, and any solution to avoid possibly include a look at a fossil, free, a fossil fuel free world, when and how, and how are we going to achieve it is what we are going to discuss. The moderator for this session is going to be uh, Sean Sutherland. 
She is the co-founder of A Plastic Planet. She has won multiple awards, including Entrepreneur of the Year and British Investor of the Year. Sean is a serial entrepreneur with varied backgrounds. Joining on the grand panel is someone we met yesterday and he's gracing the platform today as well. We saw his video just now, Mr. Suman Sinha. Uh, he's the chairman and MD of Renew Power. Along with him, we have Mr. Mahesh Kohli. He's the president and joint MD Green Co. And Mr. Vikram Kaila, CEO, Mitra Energy Limited. Welcome panel. Welcome, sir. We're looking forward for the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akriti, and good morning from the UK, and good afternoon, anybody watching in India or beyond. Um, it, so yes, this, this is the panel, Fossil Fuel Free World, When and How. My name is Sean Sutherland. I'm co-founder of A Plastic Planet. We are a UK but international organization which is really focused on one goal, to ignite and inspire the world to turn off the plastic tap. So it is, feels very appropriate to me to be chairing this esteemed panel today and with myself also as an entrepreneur to be focused on the future opportunities. And I loved that video, Suman, thank you for that, which was so positive and optimistic about the opportunities ahead as we transition from fossil fuels to renewables today. Many of you may know um, the new CEO of BP, Bernard Looney who took office some six months ago now. And I, I listened to a podcast of his at the weekend and he had this very interesting line, which was, we are giving people something they need, but they don't want. How do we change this now to something that people need, but also want? So I would like to now introduce my um, grand panel. And first we have Sumant Singer, who founded Renew Power 10 years ago. Renew Power is now India's leading clean energy company, generating 1% of India's total electricity, which is mitigating half a percent of India's total carbon emissions, proving what is possible. As you've just seen, he's recently published a book called Fossil Free, and I will be inviting um, Sumant to talk a little bit about that later. Next, we have Vikram Kailas, Vice Chairman and MD of the Mitra Group, one of India's premier renewable energy and electric vehicle companies. Um, Vikram is a philanthropist, father, a tech entrepreneur, and he's also a frequent keynote speaker. And I was very interested to read that he was an advisor on the master plan of the new India. And third, Lastly, but very much not least, we have Mahish Kohli, president and co-founder of the Green Co Group. Mahish has over 15 years experience in renewables and carbon markets. Green Co is a seven gigawatt diversified renewable platform and leading, en leading the energy transition in, ND in India with major investments in energy storage technologies. Now, first I thought it would be good to invite our panel to just speak for a couple of minutes each about their personal mission and what drives them in their business before we move on to specific questions. And I encourage anybody who is, who is listening to this panel now to drop questions into the chat box so that we can ensure that this is a very inclusive session. So first, if I, if I could ask Vikram to spend a couple of minutes just talking about his personal mission. Thanks, Sean. Uh... Good morning, good afternoon, uh, everybody, depending upon where you are in the world now. Uh, so uh, Mitra, we started the company about 10 years ago uh, when renewable energy was not, uh, for lack of another word, in fashion. Uh, at that point in time, uh, we, we saw the transition happening from uh, thermal sources to uh, you know, non-thermal uh, sources um, and played a large role along with my other colleagues here, Sumant uh, and uh, Mahesh, in bringing down the cost of power from about uh, five rupees a unit to probably in the recent bid about you know, two rupees uh, a unit of power. Um, when we started, the industry was almost non-existent. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we had literally about 10,000 megawatts of uh, renewable energy uh, generating in the country and, pri and primarily tax-driven investments, 
not really uh, put up for uh, the sake of generating power. Uh, to now, I think we are hitting closer to a uh, 100 gigawatt uh, number, uh, you know, anytime, anytime now. So it's been a more than a 10x growth in uh, in uh, less than 10 years, um, and I'm you know, happy to have played a key role in triggering of this uh, surge. We did uh, we approached this industry differently than what was done earlier, and uh, we were. Uh, classic market disruptors uh, at that point in time, um, and of course joined by several other people in the industry, and now it's it's more of a mainstream uh, industry at at this stage. Um, in in terms of my personal mission, we um, as much as this is a great opportunity, we f- I feel that. Um, Uh, this is the next trillion or multi-trillion um, dollar industry that is sort of um, ahead of us. It's not simply going going fossil free. I think there'll be. I'll probably talk about it a little bit later. Um, you know, once in the panel, but it's a whole new way of life um, that that probably we're going to lead in the next ten or twenty years. Um, it, it's uh, it's it's bigger than the industrial revolution. It's probably Uh, much more closer to the uh, to the information technology revolution rather than uh, the industry revolution, and that that keeps me excited and that keeps me hooked on to this uh, sector. Thank you, Shah. Yeah, thank you, Vikram, and I love that that um, philosophy of just the scale of what we're encountering now. You know, this is not just about energy. That the symbolism of the fact this is we are going to live in a completely different way, much more empathetically with our planet than perhaps we have for the last hundred years. Suman, can I turn to you, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to Ty for having me uh, on this panel, and 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 Fab for playing that film earlier as well. Um, you know, I think. Um, When we started off uh, around the same time that two of my colleagues had also started off, uh, uh, as as Vikram said, uh, renewables was very much a niche area, and uh, therefore, in some ways, uh, uh, you know, we had to spend the last, um, let's say, uh, from 2010 to about 2017 or so, uh, working in a sector where there was still a lot of naysayers, there were a lot of uh, skeptics. It was something that was good for the environment and good for climate change. but people did not really have this belief that it was that it could actually become a mainstream sector and i think about a couple of years ago when the cost of renewables came down is when people really began to realize that uh, renewables actually was something that was here to stay and was in fact becoming mainstream and the reason i wrote the book also partly was to really start talking about the fact that we're living in this age of a massive energy transition um, which people are still not recognizing fully Uh, that we're moving from the era of fossil fuels to an era which is going to be clean, and uh, while that is being driven a lot by commercial reasons, there's also, of course, this whole climate change imperative that is facing us as well. And so there's this very fortunate uh, combination of both of these factors that is coming together at this point in time. And as a result of that, for from both from both the climate change and therefore the mandate perspective, as well as for commercial reasons. um uh, it is now clear that renewables is going to drive the growth of this whole of the whole energy paradigm in the future and eventually it will also replace the existing capacities and so therefore you know we are right at the cusp of that change beginning to register in people's minds that we are in fact in this in this midst of this big inflection point right now and technology is going to evolve very rapidly government changes and policies will have to evolve very rapidly and all of us as companies will have to also change our own mindset and business models around how we are thinking about the future i can tell you for example that you know when you introduced uh, vikram and 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 mahesh uh, you talked about maitra being in electric vehicles uh, uh, greenco being in electric in, in in storage you you know if you talk to them a couple of years ago they might not have said that but today those opportunities are also coming into play and like that there will be many other opportunities that will also evolve and so to your question about what is the purpose here the purpose really is to i think for all of us is to build companies that are able to take advantage of all of these new uh, phenomenal changes that are taking place around us and how we can capitalize on those and in doing so uh, play transformational roles in changing societies and changing how we use uh, and interact with energy not just electricity but also energy more broadly 
uh, and also therefore build a country uh, or build a globe that is eventually more sustainable. So I think in some ways, all of us are trying to play that role. And what is very critical in this whole effort is to build companies that stand the test of time and that are sustainable in nature. So I think all of us perhaps um, are focused on doing some of that as well. And, and you know, you may all have also seen that there is now also what is happening is that the market value is shifting from the fossil fuel companies to the, to the clean energy companies. And that I think that value transference is something that is going to really, really continue to happen in the future. And while large uh, companies like the oil and gas companies are also trying to make the transition, you know, for us, it's a little bit easier because we're just coming from that heritage of being clean to begin with. And therefore, you know, we are used to dealing with new technologies and so on. So for us, in some ways, it's a little bit easier to do that. So I think that's really the purpose of what we are trying to, to do here. Wonderful. Thank you, Sumant. Um, Mahish, can I turn to you? Thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks for inviting for this panel. Uh, I think if you look at the journey, uh, just want to hear where we started. You know, uh, it's around mid 2000, 2005, we came across an interesting article on Nature's Magazine, which defined something called how do you internalize the externalities of nature? Uh, and it had a pie chart saying when we start talking about GDP as a measurement of quality of life, uh, there's something called GDP, which is man made, and, and GDP, which is nature's uh, supporting the man made GDP. And what's interesting is to achieve a global GDP of around you know, 45. Uh, trillion, and nature had to support with another 45 trillion worth of resources, which has not been accounted for, or, or it's not been uh, defined in the balance sheets uh, of businesses. And, and the concept was saying, you know, unless you start internalizing those externalities of nature services, like whether it's clean air, clean water, uh, soil nutrients, and all of that, at, at some point, um, you know, the planet and the population will start believing that uh, the, the current economic surplus we have and the budgets we have are all uh, mad-made, right? So that really uh, was a thought-provoking article that started me into understanding uh, this, this clean technologies and, and, and uh, the business models and that. And I started my career with uh, active carbon trading business uh, out of uh, Sweden. And that kind of gave me an inside view into what was happening in Europe, which was at the time leading in carbon markets, and also, you know, uh, led me to travel to India. Um, and 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 the view we took at the time was, uh, uh, well, India is a large growing energy economy. Um, we do rely on 80, 85 percent of our uh, fuels being imported, and we we looked at renewable sources as a localized fuel to start with. And we said, hey, can we use, uh, India is blessed, probably one of the few countries blessed with all kinds of uh, renewable resources, whether it's biomass, solar, wind, hydro. And we said, can we use proven technologies and deliver uh, most economical grid parity energy? So we looked at it initially renewables as a domestic fuel and, and clean technologies in a proven form to deliver uh, value to the market. And, uh, you know, as Samantan Vikram mentioned, or, or, or a period of time, the regulations later on supported this sector. And uh, I think we are at a very interesting crossroads now that, uh, um, you know, we have fossil fuel, uh, you know, segments needing to subsidize, uh, not renewables, no, you know. So we have uh, the fossil companies asking for subsidies and asking for support to stay alive. Uh, versus uh, the, the transformation happening today where um, companies engaged in renewables are kind of forcing its way into the transition. And, the, and, and when we talk about uh, net zero emission targets, what we see here in, what we hear in OECD markets, talking about, you know, 2050, will it be 100% renewables, 2040? I think in a market like India, we can achieve that much faster, maybe, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ahead of, what is what we hear in Europe and, and those other OECD markets. So that's largely because the unique positioning India has and, and the kind of re and resources it already has and the entrepreneurship that is alive in the country uh, will probably achieve those 100% uh, renewable targets probably you know, much ahead of most other developed markets. 
Great. Thank, thank you, Mahesh. And you bring up a, a really interesting topic that I talk about a lot when I talk about plastic, um, because obviously we the fossil fuel industry is the most subsidized industry in the world. And, and for us, you know, working with governments and industry to try and wean them off plastic, which of course is derived from fossil fuels, I, it, we do not have a level playing field for any other materials in plastic because it's, it's now it's the, the most subsidized material on the planet as well. So Samantha, I wanted to, to turn to you because obviously the topic of this panel is fossil fuel free world when and how. And I wanted to ask you, do you ever think that we will see 100% non fossil fuel energy? And do you have any kind of time scale in mind? When do you think that this will be possible? Certainly not in our lifetime, Sean unfortunate as that is. I think it's going to take a lot longer than that. Look, I think if you look at uh, countries like India, for example, uh, you know, while a lot of the European countries have already announced targets for getting to net zero by 2050 for the most part, net zero doesn't mean fossil free in a sense. Uh, it does mean that there will be some fossil fuels and then there'll be some, you know, taking carbon out of the atmosphere. So therefore you will continue to have some fossil based industries even at that point in time. Uh, so I think this, uh, this issue about getting to zero fossil fuel, I think that's not even going to happen in, in European countries, which are the most aggressive and ambitious as far as climate change targets are concerned, even by 2050. Now, China, as you know, has also announced a net zero target by 2060. But countries like India, uh, which uh, are still on, the, on, our, on our development path, and many other countries like India, let's say African countries, other emerging market countries, you know, we are not even talking about net zero at this point in time. We're not even talking about peak coal for that matter. So I think it's going to take a fair bit of time for um, even countries like India, even to get to net zero. And that could happen maybe 2060, 2070. I mean, I don't know. That conversation in the Indian uh, context has not even started. Um, so I think what therefore is, is going to be required very urgently to balance out the likelihood of the fact that we will continue to have fossil fuel emissions of carbon happening into the atmosphere we will need to balance it out by developing carbon, uh, net negative carbon technologies, whether it's carbon capture and storage or some other mechanism so that we can start sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. Because if we don't get to that, uh, to those technologies, then we will never have a situation that we'll be ever, you know, get even close to meeting our, our you know, carbon emissions targets uh, globally. So to your question of, are we going to see a fossil free world? I would imagine not. Um, certainly not in the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, uh, and, and certainly in countries like India, it will take even longer because we have a lot of legacy systems as well that will take time to, uh, to take out. And um, therefore, I think in, in anticipation of that, we have to start developing other types of negative carbon technologies as well. Yep, to, to balance that out. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mahesh, I, I wanted to ask you about specifically about India, because from everything, from everything that you, you three, um, the businesses that you've created, it seems to me that India has set a very accelerated path towards the transition to renewables, particularly sitting in Europe. It seems that it's, it's really an accelerated path. You're talking about 2040. We're still talking about 2050. Why do you think and how do you think this has been made possible? Is it, is it market dynamics? Is it demand driven or has government policy actually helped this happen? What's interesting is probably India has seen the real triple bottom benefits of this transition. Um, I think you know both from the economics of energy and and as as, in, as I mentioned to you, India is a uniquely uh, in terms of energy. It's a fast growing energy economy, um, probably third or fourth largest importer of oil, and so any form of domestic energy source like so you know, for us India uh, renewables and energy security go uh, to go together, right? So. Uh, some energy economics perspective from uh, environmental benefits and social benefits. So really, India has benefited uh, at a, a triple bottom level. Um, in addition to that, of course, it, the whole sector got uh, uh, enormous support from um, you know all previous governments. I think, but what really I believe strongly is helping this transition is uh, the entrepreneurship in this market and this economy uh, we have. Um, and unlike again in most other markets, the energy transition is is kind of led by big oil companies or big power companies. There are hardly two, three, or in each economy. I think India has you know 15, 20 companies driving this transition. 
driven through entrepreneurship and competitive and and that's a different uh, model which kind of created more innovation more um, uh, fast adoption of technology more risk taking uh, instead of the narrative traditionally positioned by the big oil and gas companies that let's move from coal to oil and gas for 10 15 years and then look to move to renewables later i think uh, the entrepreneurship models in india have really uh, accelerated that transition um, much faster and of course um, the demand now has understood the value uh, in both in terms of economics and in terms of uh, uh, other forms of uh, benefits like job creation and investments so it's largely the private investments that is driven this acceleration uh, of course supported by the government uh, stable policy and of course we just we still have some challenges to get through that but yet it's india is benefiting from its strong entrepreneurial uh, base compared to most of the markets yes thank you thank you mahesh you know, you know yet time and time again we come back really to the the role of the entrepreneur in this you know the pioneering entrepreneur vikram i wanted to to ask you a little bit about your experience in this journey towards transition are there any significant roadblocks that you have encountered in your own business do you feel that there is a new momentum now that things are are shifting faster and some of those roadblocks are easier to come to overcome absolutely uh, sean as uh, as we had alluded to earlier um, this was um, a non existing in- industry when all of us uh, began our journey in uh, 2010 uh, people didn't even think um, just to give you a context uh, people thought a wind turbine is a tax instrument they never even considered uh, it as a source of generating uh, power um so literally what happened in at least in india was um if somebody that was only tax instrument that was available so if anybody wanted a tax break um they wanted 80 80 percent depreciation they would approach somebody and say hey you know i want this tax break can you put up a turbine for me and literally not even visit that turbine you know in its lifetime because they only motivation was to get the um, accelerated uh, depreciation so we um, uh, like my said like it was a very entrepreneurial journey where we had to convince every stakeholder in the in the process uh, whether it was the manufacturer whether it was the bank that was lending money to the sector uh, whether it is the buyer of power um, which is which is sort of the you know discom um, you know and and whole lot of uh, you know other investors that come in as equity that that is actually something that you can make a uh, reasonable return on um, and there will be reasonable uh, sort of growth uh, so um, in at that point in time typically it was like a five year funding funding on balance sheet So we had to convert that into a uh, first uh, non recourse funding uh, second into a more longer term funding of you know 13 year 14 year um, we had to make sure the pps were uh, you know can be financed we had to you know change the contracts with the manufacturers we had to focus on onm so it was literally like disrupting and recreating an existing industry um this was a journey until the first 5 or 6 uh, years and slowly as the as as all of us established that this is reliable power and um, and also cheap you know by 2017 the prices started to uh, thanks to the innovation um, and risk taking um, both and and the confluence of other uh, various other things where its interest rates coming down or as understand the technology better or panel prices coming down uh, innovation in the wind turbines uh, materials you know batteries etc the prices started to come down in 2017 and that's when the industry really exploded in the last uh, you know two or three years uh, we still face uh, a lot of legacy issues um, you know for example the way i would put it is if we were a new country today right we wouldn't structure the power sector the way it is right now right because we don't have the benefit of what we know now we didn't have the benefit of that 20 years ago 
you know 30 years ago the traditional draw a line you know have you know 50 year contract you know have a discom in the middle to distribute the energy so i think that is all passe if somebody is starting a new country today they wouldn't do it this way you could just generate a lot of your power in your backyard um, and the rules and regulations of the sector would be you know very very different um so in in, in india specifically the uh, there's been a lot of momentum from the government side um and uh, they have done a lot uh, to ensure we get to where we are uh, today um but uh, to take it from 1x to 10x these policies were helpful but to take it from the 10x to the 100x uh, which is where i think uh, the government has laid is its uh, eyes on uh, then we need to rethink all the you know policy all over again um as the technology was as the industry was the policy needs to evolve along with it um and then typically we need to rethink uh, the discom we need to again rethink the way it is funded um the projects are funded and we also need to rethink the way projects are structured um uh, whether storage has to be at the local level or at the state level or at the country level the grid has to be at the local level or the state level or the grid level so we need to rethink all of this um uh, for establishing a long term uh, you know viability or a future for this sector so let me let me stop there yeah yeah you know thank you vikram as somebody gave me a, a a brilliant visual analogy recently when we were talking about you know the um the difficulty of legacy and obviously i work a lot a lot with the big consumer goods companies and they said it's almost like a ceo right now is flying a fighter jet and he's been asked to change the engine mid flight and that's that's how difficult it is that everybody is on one trajectory and it's not a simple little tweak on the dial we are we are literally taking the titanic out of one ocean and putting it into another um so, and that's that takes uh, a, a lot um oh my goodness i've just been told we have 3 minutes to wrap and we've only just begun um we've had a number of questions coming in that i just wanted to see if anyone had a had a, a quick answer to um which really is the role of the individual and somebody has already uh, asked if all the cars were to become electric where would the power come from and also is there as an individual can we be making better choices in order to uh, accelerate the adoption of renewables does anybody want to jump in on that and then i want to um wrap with everybody giving me just one thing that excites them about the future and one thing that scares them so uh, maybe i can jump in i think um there is no let me put it this way there is um, the incremental cost of manufacturing power is almost negligible um there is no as long as there is no lack of demand and there is no lack of uh, capability to produce the power that is required uh, for whether it is cars whether it is uh, you know any of the other appliances that are we are that we are using in our you know day to day life um and it is going to happen and like i said in the beginning um this will completely change the geopolitical and uh, humanity also um as we as we sort of uh, you know go along so i think there'll be enough power um you know that we can uh, produce i think there's enough theories that show that uh, just rajasthan can power entire india or us and double it you know whatever so um, that that's never uh, never ever Okay, and Vikram, one thing that scares you, and one thing that excites you about the future? Um, excites me is um, incredible amount of uh, opportunity and um, a new way to um, live um, away from carbon fuels and more in uh, harmony with the nature without actually elevating the uh, standard of living. Uh, what scares me the most is uh, you know all the uh you know you know how governments and regulators uh, will adapt to this change you know that that is the part that scares me yeah cement yeah i was going to pretty much say what vikram said i think from a business person standpoint the scale of the opportunity in front of us is just so vast it's unbelievable and um uh, you know it's 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 going to be tremendous in terms of the scale of the opportunity but also in the areas in which this opportunity is going to manifest itself today 
when we talk about renewable energy we talk mostly about renewable electricity but i think going forward there's going to be more and more of the, uh, you know actual applications of renewable energy in uh, energy in in general whether through uh, green hydrogen whether through um, you know uh, the areas of uh, looking at agricultural supplies um, and so on so there are going to be many opportunities where renewable energy in the hard to abate sectors for example is going to become much more prominent so i think you know one of the things that therefore is going to be an important issue for all of us uh, in this in this panel is going to be to make the right choices about which areas we want to potentially operate in so uh, so i think that's really the thing that is going to be exciting uh, it is going to be much more open but also much bigger opportunity the thing that does scare me is the issue that you know in an area where technology is evolving so rapidly uh, policy makers ability to set right policies is going to be severely challenged and uh, therefore do they have the right skill sets and the right knowledge uh, to make policies uh, you know which very often stay for 20 25 years and uh, just given the fact that um, you know if if we were put in those positions knowing what we know it would be hard for us as well now policy makers for the most part are non technical people who move from ministry to ministry so it's a lot harder for them so that i think is the thing that really worries me a little bit get yeah, i i share your fear particularly when we know the the might of the fossil fuel industry when it comes to lobbying um you know that we we can we can witness first hand in the us mahish i'd love to finish with you if you could just give us a little bit more of your wisdom on what scares you and what excites you for the future Now, I think uh, the colleagues have really said most of it. I think I'll, I'll keep it short. So, I guess what excites me is that uh, the decarbonisation path. You know, we, we can move. Just uh, we, we used to be more focused on the power sector. We see opportunities to now uh, enable decarbonisation outside the power sector and convergence into what I call as the molecule sector. You know, uh, power sector was of course really had a lot of uh, support. So, so taking some other. Uh, technologies that are evolving fast enough to bring uh, hydrogen and other forms to really decarbonize the molecules uh, sector as well uh, which we believe looks like is a possibility in the, in the medium term uh, is really exciting for me i think uh, as someone mentioned i think what's uh, scary part is in a change in leadership which uh, like what you've seen in us uh, taking uh, and all the hard work done in the last 10 years in a different direction Great. Well, what I have really learned this morning, I'm sure everybody who's listened listened can feel encouraged and excited about the future because what I I've learned today is this is such a new business. You know, one of you said in 20, 2010 this was a non-existent industry and here we are only 10 years later and the businesses that you have built and the optimism that you have and the entrepreneurship that we can see particularly out of you know a superpower like india gives me uh, extreme optimism for my children's future and i'm sure for for everybody within the audience and um, so i will now hand back thank you to my panel to vikram mahish sumant for your wisdom buy that book buy sumant's book is my my final message <laughs> to you. everybody thank you for fossil free you can get it on amazon but even better go to your local bookstore and buy it <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then i will hand back to i think to akriti um and have a great rest of the day